Please rise for prayer. Begin with the Apolitikion of St. John Chrysostom, whose feast day is today. Grace shining forth from your mouth, like a beacon has illumined the universe and disclose to the world treasures of uncovetousness and shown us the heights of humility but while instructing us by your words o father john chrysostom intercede with the word christ our god to save our souls let us pray to the Lord, Lord have mercy. Lord, you have granted us to offer these common prayers in unison and have promised that when two or three agree in your name, you will grant their requests. Fulfill now, O Lord, the petitions of your servants as may be of benefit to them, granting us in the present age the knowledge of your truth and in the age to come eternal life. For you, O God, are good and love mankind, and to you we offer up glory. To the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. My hope is the Father, my refuge is the Son, my protection, the Holy Spirit, Holy Trinity, glory to you. I place all my hope in you, Mother of God, keep me under your protection. Please be seated. Welcome once again for our monthly gathering of the Adult Education Program. Very excited to be meeting with you guys again today and to continue talking about the Divine Liturgy. I think for me as a priest... There's no topic I would rather discuss with parishioners or with fellow priests than worshiping in the divine liturgy service. It is what we are as Orthodox Christians, and I cannot emphasize that enough. So I'm so happy and so thrilled to be here with you today. Thank you. So before we start our new material, let's quickly review what we did last month. So last session, we looked at the antiphons. We talked about the hymns uh, through the intercessions of the Theotokos, Tespres Viestis Theotoku. We talked about the hymn, Sosonimasi Efeu, Save Us, O Son of God. We talked briefly about the hymn, O Monogenisio, So Only Begotten Son and Word of God. And we talked about all of the antiphons and every the history of the antiphons, the processional liturgies of ancient Constantinople, and how the antiphons were what was chanted on the road to the main church where the liturgy was going to be celebrated that day. We talked about why music is important in our worship service <clears throat> as a tool for connecting with the prayers, making prayer easier for us, as well as for education purposes. We also talked about the theology that was in the antiphons. We talked about the Theotokos and her role in our salvation. We talked about how Christ was resurrected and overcame death for us and for our sake, and how every Sunday in the Orthodox Church is a, a celebration of the resurrection, as I like to call it, a, a mini Pascha celebration. Finally, I left you guys with the prayers of the antiphons, which were in your packet, and we reflected on how in these prayers we ask for all of the things that we're going to need on our journey to God's kingdom through the liturgy. We need mercy, compassion, salvation and blessing, sanctification, glorification, for God to hear our prayers for the knowledge of the truth and for eternal life in the kingdom to come. And so through the antiphons, we take our next step towards God's heavenly kingdom. Now, before we move into the next part of the liturgy, I think it's appropriate today to take a brief minute to talk about the life of this author of our text that we're studying, which, of course, is St. John Chrysostom. Today, November 13th, is the celebration of his feast day in his honor. So I want to take a few minutes to talk about his life, about some of the contributions he made to our church, and why he's such a beloved saint in Orthodoxy, and really throughout all the world, even the West reads Chrysostom. 
So uh, it's, he's, a, he's a wonderful and very powerful and blessed saint. Uh, I'm going to do a short, hopefully short, uh, biographical synopsis, as we can say. Um, but in your packets, I put a longer version of it for you guys to read, including a little icon on the back, which is from one of the events that I'll talk about uh, here briefly. So listen now for the, the short story of his life, and then that's the medium story of his life. You can read it when you go home. The long story you can find in books. <clears throat> so St. John is from Antioch in the Middle East. He is born in the 4th century, so the middle 300s, 347, sometime, sometime around then. And he was brought up with the best possible education. Imagine someone going to Harvard or Oxford or Cambridge, something like that. St. John received a very uh, comparable education. He was a very, very smart young man. He was destined to have a career as a lawyer or a politician. He was under the tutelage at the time of one of the great rhetoricians, one of the great speakers of the age, but he was a pagan, the speaker, this uh, St. John's professor, so to speak. And this, this pagan professor is quoted as saying, John would have been the greatest of the speakers if not the Christians had stole him away from us. So even the pagan world understood how, um, how, how talented and how blessed of speech St. John was. He passed up all the earthly fame and all of the uh, money and the occupation and the fame that came would have come with his position and became a monk For six years. He lived in poor monasteries and in caves During this time he lived in asceticism meaning he was living a very harsh life He was not allowing himself to eat very much just enough to survive to not uh, Experience uh, bodily comfort he was praying constantly but because of this harsh way of life his health was negatively affected and so, because he became sick, he had to return to the world and go back to Antioch. Now, some people would say, well, this is a proof that monasticism is not a natural way of life, that it's not to this or that. But really, what this was, was God calling St. John back because he had other plans for him, which we'll see now. So, on his return to Antioch, St. John was ordained by the patriarch, a deacon, and then a priest. He was immediately... Uh, made a preacher and he was teaching the people in the churches and he became very famous for his homilies this is how he received received the name chrysostom chrysostom of course in greek chrysostomos golden mouth and it's not because he had gold teeth it's because the words that came out of his mouth were like gold for the people the people would listen to him for hours on end waiting to receive that gold that was coming from his soul and through his lips when he was called in, 19, in 397, excuse me, 397, he was called to become the Archbishop of Constantinople, which was the highest authority in the Byzantine world at the time. The people of Antioch rioted. They, they, they rioted in the streets and did not want to leave. They did not want him to leave them. They even threatened violence against the emperor and against his guard in Antioch. So the imperial envoys had to smuggle him out of the city by night so that, the, they were, so that they could avoid civil unrest at the leaving of St. John from Antioch. They tell how beloved he was by his people and by his flock. On becoming a bishop in Constantinople, he began cleaning house. At the time, Constantinople, the church in Constantinople was plagued by many uh, scandalous clergy, scandals that were going on. It was not a very good situation. But St. John immediately began correcting the problems with the church there. He gave large sums of money to the poor. He expelled uh, dishonorable clergy. And he preached repentance and salvation to the people. And the people began to love him. He spoke boldly against the moral decay of the time, so much so that he offended the emperor and his wife. The books, if you read it, they say the emperor was kind of a weak man and his wife was really running the show. So the empress, I believe her name was Evdoxia, she uh, had him exiled in the year 403 to Pondos, which is in northern Turkey, modern-day Turkey, on the Black Sea. This infuriated the people so much that they began protesting again for the saint's return. And on the first night of St. John's exile, Constantinople was hit by a large earthquake. And Queen Evdoxia was terrified by this, and she brought St. John back because she thought that God was sending her a message that she had, uh, that she had displeased him with her action. However, St. John did not last long in his second term because, again, he was 
speaking out against the queen and her uh, evil ways, so to speak, in 403, so now only two years after his return, uh, she held a big celebration honoring a silver statue that she had built of herself that she had placed in front of Hagia Sophia, right in front. And in honor of this statue that she had built of herself, they had a large riotous party. And so St. John, of course, bashed her in, to the people and, and said that well, this was wrong. And so he was exiled again in 404. Despite many attempts from St. John's supporters to have him reinstated, the emperor decreed that he was to be sent even farther away so that the people would forget about him. St. John, unfortunately, died on the journey from the harsh travels and the ill treatment of the 310 guards that they had sent to, to guard him on his way to his exile. Having foreseen the day of his death through a vision, he gave up his soul in the church of St. Basiliscus in Pondos. And his final words, even though he had been so ill-treated, were, Glory be to God for all things. We have inherited many great treasures from St. John Chrysostom in the form of his sermons and his homilies. He's left us over 1,100 existing sermons on the scriptures and many other epistles, I believe over 200 epistles that he wrote, personal letters that he wrote to other people. So we're talking about 1,300 complete texts of St. John Chrysostom that still exist today. It is said that when he was explaining the epistle of St. Paul in his letters, St. Paul would visit him and speak to him in his left ear. That's the icon that I gave to you guys in your packet. You can see St. John Chrysostom on the left with St. Paul speaking into his, one of his ears. <clears throat> so whatever he wrote was divinely inspired. Now because of these divine encounters with St. Paul, St. John after his death, his left ear never decayed. If the relic of his skull can be found at Vatopedi Monastery in Mount Athos. And if you go there, I've had the blessing to venerate the relic of his skull. Uh, you can see that the ear is still intact on his, on his skull, which is amazing. Uh, last but not least, of course, he left us the divine liturgy which we are studying. So may St. John bless us and intercede on our behalf that we understand and gain some wisdom from his work and through God's mercy. Now. The small entrance is the next section of the liturgy that we're going to be talking about. So right after the finish of the antiphons, the third antiphon being the resurrectional hymn of the day on a Sunday, we go directly into the small entrance. Now, the small entrance, of course, is when the priest, myself or Father Timothy or whoever priest is serving, takes the gospel book from the table and he's led by the altar boys who have candles. And they come out and the priest joins them in the procession and they stand in the middle here facing the altar, and the priest says, Wisdom arise, and they chant the entrance hymn, which we call the Isodikon. On Sundays, it's almost always, Come let us worship and bow down before Christ our God. Depending on the feast season, the hymn can change. For example, after Pascha, there's a special hymn. After Christmas, there's a special hymn. So during certain feast periods, the hymn changes as well. So, after he chants, after the priest chants the Isodikon in the entrance hymn, he enters the altar again and places the gospel book back on the table. Now, if we were to look for the first, if we were to come to liturgy for the first time, or welcome one of our friends to come to liturgy, they might see the small entrance and think, what was the point of that entrance? Think about it. The priest literally, in the small entrance, picks up the book, comes out, walks around the table, makes a big circle, walks back in, and puts the book right back where he picked it up from 20 seconds earlier. So if you were not familiar with the liturgy, you might think that was completely pointless. Why, why are we doing this? I even had a professor at the seminary who lovingly, I say lovingly, referred to the small entrance as the holy U-turn of the divine liturgy. Which used to make me very upset, of course, not wanting to treat the divine liturgy in a sacrilegious manner. But there is some level to truth in that term, the Holy U-turn. Uh, especially if we don't know where it comes from and what it means. So we have to open our history books once again. So the where it comes from. The small entrance in the worship service of the Orthodox used to be the start of the liturgy. Remember we said the antiphons, of course, were on the way to church, chanted on the way. So then when they would arrive at the church, the whole congregation would gather outside, led by the bishop, 
and if it was in Constantinople, the emperor as well. And they would enter the church together as one body, as one people. Not like how we have it today where everybody drives in and we kind of mosey on in as we get here and the church kind of fills up as the service goes along. The people there were there from the beginning and they all entered together. And this was the small, what we call today, the small entrance. Now, even though the small entrance is no longer the starting point, as we said, our liturgy has changed many times over the past 2,000 years. Uh, the congregation now is already inside the church by the time the small entrance has taken place. Even though the church, even though the congregation is already in the church, we keep this act, the act of exiting the altar and making a small entrance, uh, the priest making the entrance with the gospel book. An un another interesting question is, why does the priest carry the gospel book during the small entrance? Unlike today, where books can be printed and reprinted as many times as you want at a very low cost. At the time, when the liturgy was first being celebrated in its fullness, books were very hard to come by. They were expensive. They had to be hand copied. Uh, of course, the gospel books, even our gospel books today, are very richly decorated with precious metals and jewels and things like that. So the gospel books were very, very expensive and hard to replace. Now, so the gospel book was not kept on the altar table the way that we keep it on the altar table now. Now if Panagias, if someone came and took the gospel book and we never found it again, we could order another one, it would be here in two days and we'd have, we would be fine. Back then it would have been much more difficult. So they didn't keep it in the altar. They would either keep it in one of two places that I've read in my research, my limited research unfortunately. Uh, they would either keep it where the priest vest, they would have a safe there and the, the gospel would be locked away in this room or the deacon of the church would keep it at his house. And it would be his responsibility to bring it to church on the morning of the liturgy. Which is why we see the deacon, if there is a deacon serving, he's the one that carries the gospel in the small entrance, not the priest. So it was at this point of the service, during the small entrance, that the gospel would actually be carried into the... What was that? Someone would have to go to his house and get it. I'm sure they would. I'm sure they would have... Uh, uh, measures to carry these things out. Um, so it, it would be at this point of the service when the deacon or the priest would bring the book into the church. So that's why the priest holds the gospel book. So that's kind of the history. That's the background. That the, the small entrance was the beginning of the liturgy. Everybody would enter together. And so now the priest and the altar boys kind of mimic this action and carry the gospel book in as well. But it doesn't, that doesn't explain, though, why we still do it. That explains where it came, came from. That explains the, the history behind it. But it doesn't explain why we still do that. Why we still do the small entrance. For that, we have to look at the theology and the symbolism that is behind these actions. In other words, what is really taking place during the small entrance? And what is the church trying to reveal to us through the small entrance? The small entrance is itself is an act of God revealing himself to us. This takes place through the gospel book, which are, of course, the holy scriptures. These are the words that Christ speaks to us, and we hear his words every time we come for the, for the liturgy, assuming we are here on time, of course, to hear the gospel. For this reason, the priest carries the gospel book up high. We're taught at seminary to carry the gospel book high so that everybody can see it. In a way, the small entrance is an announcement that Christ has come into our presence and that he soon will be speaking to us. Father Anthony Canaris, I'm sure by now you've heard me refer to him. He's a priest in Minnesota. He's a very uh, holy man and he's um, a prolific author here in America. Many books in English, many wonderful books in English that he's written. He writes that in the small entrance, God is about to show himself to us by revealing his will to us in the scripture, readings, and the sermon. God is about to show himself to us by revealing his will to us in the scripture, readings, and the sermon. He will allow us to see how much he loves us and how precious we are to him. The small entrance is like a window through which we look to see God as he reveals himself to us. I'll repeat that last part again. The small entrance is like a window the small entrance is like a window through which we look to see God as he reveals himself to us. By the way, the, whatever quotes I have today are in your packet as well, so you can follow along with the quotes. 
So the entrance of the gospel book there is not just a symbolic remembrance of the past, but it's a, an act of Christ's true entrance into the liturgy with us. For this reason, the priest ex- uh, chants, Wisdom arise. In other words, stand up and honor Christ the true God. He is here. Listen to him and his life-giving words. Be wise as he is all wise. Honor him with the attention of your body, mind, and soul. Then the priest chants, Come, let us worship and fall down before Christ our God. Truly, when we see the gospel book, this says is that we should see Christ himself. For he is the one coming to be with us. I read a story in the book, Experiences of the Divine Liturgy. It's a wonderful book all about the liturgy and things that have taken place during the liturgy. I read a story in this book of a Christian who was worshiping in a church during an all-night vigil. This devout person and pious person saw during the entrance the priest not lifting up the gospel book, but lifting up a small child who was bright and glowing as they performed the small entrance and glorified him in the entrance hymn. So he saw not the gospel, but he saw the child Christ being carried by the priests. So when we were in church and we witnessed the small entrance, we should be moved to reverence. We should be moved to pay attention, knowing that we are in the presence of Christ himself and that soon he's going to be speaking, speaking to us. If we're to truly understand what is happening at the time of the small entrance, I also think it's hugely important that we look at the prayer of the small entrance, which also should be in your packet. After all, the prayers tell us what we are doing and what we are asking for from God in the liturgy. The prayer of the small entrance goes as follows. O Master, Lord our God, who have appointed the heavenly orders and hosts and legions of angels and archangels for the service of your glory, grant that with our entrance there may be an entrance of holy angels serving with us and glorifying your goodness. For to you belong all glory, honor, and worship to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. So what are we saying in the prayer? What is in the prayer? The the words of the prayer are saying that we're asking God to send down into our liturgy many, many, many angels to take part and serve with us, to join us in worshiping the one true God. And this entrance of the angels in the liturgy is an invisible reality that actually does take place. Uh, I've, you can find in old churches icons of the divine liturgy being served by angels. Also, there are many stories of the angels revealing themselves to holy people in the liturgy. One of these stories is uh, from the life of Saint Seraphim of Sarov. He was an 18th century Russian priest monk who lived on Mount Athos. And one year he was serving Holy Week, it was Holy Thursday, and he was serving the Divine Liturgy of Holy Thursday morning. Holy Thursday morning's liturgy, of course, is the Divine Liturgy of Divine Liturgies, we say, because it is the liturgy commemorating the Mystical Supper, which was, of course, the first Holy Communion, the first Divine Liturgy. So just after the small entrance, Saint Seraphim, who was a deacon at the time, was blinded by a blinding bright light. He then saw, his eyes were opened, and he saw, entering the church, Christ himself with a large large group of angels, which he described as a swarm of bees. They made their way into the front of the church, and Christ turned and blessed all the people. Christ, St. Seraphim, then saw Christ walk into his icon on the iconostasis, and he saw the angels enter into the holy altar and serve the liturgy with the priests and the deacons. What St. Seraphim saw in his vision is what truly takes place during every divine liturgy. We are surrounded by countless angels and are in the presence of Christ himself. So the small entrance, though it does not have the practical importance that it used to have back in the ancient church, it is the physical representation of spiritual realities, that we are standing in the company of angels and of Christ. So that's the small entrance. After immediately following the small entrance, we chant the resurrectional apolitikion and the hymns of the day. We talked last month about how music is very important in our worship. And the same, so now at this point, we again express our devotion to Christ and his saints in him. I want to kind of not skip over that so much, but 
uh, move on to the Trisagion hymn, which is the next major section of the Divine Liturgy. So now after the small entrance and the chanting of the Apolitikia, uh, the priest says, Lord have mercy, and gives the, or, let us pray to the Lord, and gives the, he reads the prayer and says the exclamation for the prayer. And then the choir, or the chanters and all the people together, they chant the Trisagion hymn, which is Agios Otheos, Agios Ischiros, Agios Athanatos, Eleison Imas, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. This hymn is chanted three times, and then after the priest says Dynamis, is chanted a fourth time. Dynamis, of course, means with more strength, uh, with more power. Dynamis literally in Greek means power. Uh, so after the priest says that, we all should chant even more uh, soulfully the Trisagion hymn, as, as that's what the priest is calling on us to do. We call this hymn also the hymn of the angels. And we call it this because it's based on a passage from the book of Isaiah. In this passage, Isaiah is telling of the vision he saw in which God called him to be a prophet. We find this passage in Isaiah chapter 6. This also is in your packet, by the way. So let's read it really quickly. So, in the year that King Uzziah died, now this is, this is uh, Isaiah talking. Isaiah is the greatest of the Old Testament prophets, by the way. I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. So now Isaiah is saying how he, wa he was in a vision and he sees the Lord sitting on his throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs, which are angels, were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. He's describing the seraphim angels. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So right there we can see that Isaiah is beholding a vision of angels surrounding the throne of God. And what are they chanting? Holy, holy, holy. They're chanting the Trisagion hymn. Now, remember that in this point of the liturgy, we have just witnessed in the small entrance the multitude of angels enter into the church with us. We've prayed for it and we know, even if we don't see it with our own eyes, we know that it's true. And now we join them in their song. The Trisagion hymn is really their song that they sing to God at His throne. And now we join in with them and with one voice with the angels. Whatever takes place in the heavenly liturgy, as we talked about last year in the first year of our adult education programs, we try to mirror in our own worship. And however the angels in heaven act is how we as humans try to act as Christians living in the material world. We always try to model ourselves after the lives of the angels because they are pure and they're constantly focused on God. So our church takes these words from Isaiah, Holy, 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 Lord Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of your glory, and we expand on them because now we've come into the New Testament. The Old Testament, of course, the, the, didn't, the Jews did not have an understanding of the Holy Trinity. But now in the New Testament, God has revealed that He is indeed one God in three persons. So we chant, Holy God, Holy Mighty, Holy Immortal, have mercy on us. And each section of this hymn represents a different person of the Holy Trinity. So St. Germanos explains, Like the bodiless hosts, we cry in faith, Holy God, that is the Father. So Holy God is for the Father. Holy Mighty, that is the Son and Word of God, for he, bound, he has bound the mighty devil and made him who had dominion over death powerless through the cross and has given us life by trampling upon him. So we call Christ the Mighty One because he conquered the one that we were not able to conquer, the devil himself, death itself. And he was able through his might to conquer him. So Holy Mighty is for Christ. Holy Immortal, that is the Holy Spirit the giver of life, through whom all creation is made alive and cries out, have mercy on us. So Holy God, God the Father, Holy Mighty, for God the Son, Jesus Christ, and Holy Immortal, for God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the life-giving and divine. Now I would also like to share with you the prayer of the Trisagion hymn, which is a very beautiful prayer, which is in your packet as well. The prayer reads, O Holy God, who is resting among the Holy Ones, Praised by the seraphim with the thrice holy voice, glorified by the cherubim, and worshipped in every heavenly power. You have brought all things into being out of nothing. You have created man according to your image and likeness and adorned him with all the gifts of your grace. You give wisdom and understanding to the one who asks, 
and you will over overlook not the sinner, but have sent repentance as the way of salvation. You have granted us, your humble and unworthy servants, to stand even at this hour before the glory of your holy altar of sacrifice and to offer to you, to offer to you due worship and praise. Master, accept the Trisagion hymn also from the lips of us sinners and visit us in your goodness. Forgive all our voluntary and involuntary transgressions. Sanctify our souls and bodies. Grant that we may worship you in holiness all the days of our lives. Through the intercessions of the Holy Theotokos and of all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages. Amen. This prayer really breaks down into two parts. So the first part of this service is praise and glory. It is literally a list of all the amazing qualities and acts of God and all the amazing things that he's done for us. That he is praised and worshipped by angels. That he created the world from nothing. That he created humanity in his image and likeness. That he gives wisdom to those who seek it. That he has shown us the way of salvation, which is repentance. Just as God is holy and rests among the holy angels of heaven, so he also rests on those people whose souls are pure and holy. And so in the second part of the prayer, we ask God to make us as the angels are, to accept the hymn of the angels from our lips, to forgive and cleanse our sinful souls, making us worthy to worship God with the angels, with the saints, and with God's holy mother, the Theotokos. This is one of the, reason, one of the reasons why we come to church in the first place, to be healed and purified of our spiritual sicknesses and to be transformed into a renewed person with Christ at the center of our lives. One final thing I'll share with you before we take some questions. Father Stephanos Anagnostopoulos, who wrote that book I was talking about, Experiences of the Divine Liturgy, comments that with the thrice holy hymn, the heavenly hosts of angels and the hosts of the faithful Christians on earth, so he's saying the angels and the faithful Christians who attend church services are united in an endless and incessant doxology of God. So in this hymn, Angels and men are united in a constant glorification of God. The priest extends his arms like Moses, or raises them up on high, or bends down to the ground and says the prayer of the thrice holy hymn, which we just read. Our chanters chant the hymn, Holy God. The angels who are present are chanting along with us, and the whole triumphant church, meaning the heavenly church, or the saints, uniting with the militant church, meaning us here on earth, in one church. So this hymn unites heaven and earth, in other words. Indeed, in the Trisagion hymn, we are united with the angels and we take our next step towards God's heavenly kingdom in the liturgy. When we join again next month, we'll take even more steps towards the liturgy as we talk about the scripture readings, the homily, and hopefully the great entrance if we have time. At this time, are there any questions about the lecture today that you might have? Any lingering questions from previous sessions? Anything that you want to ask at this time? Going once, going twice. Okay. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Right. So John's question was that in the last session we talked about how the Panagia does not have divine nature. When we say nature, the Greek word usia. Uh, we're talking about what is the Theotok, you know, what is the person. When we talk about the nature of God, when we talk about the nature of Christ, what is his nature? Usually we're talking about divine or human. The Panagia is a 100% authentic human being. Of her birth, she was not divine in any way. She does not have, she's not God. She doesn't have any part of God in herself. Meaning that uh, she's like one of us, you know. She was born like a normal human being, like one of us. In contrast, Christ was God pre-eternal. So he has divine nature and he has human nature because he was born as a human being. So when I say that Theotokos does not have a divine essence, she is holy. She was, she was divinized, so to speak. She, or not divinized. She, was, um, she uh, received uh, the purification and perfection from God, making her very holy and dwelling among God and Christ in, in heaven, she's not God of herself. That's, what, that's all I meant. She's not God of herself. She doesn't have any God in her nature. She wasn't born as God. Uh, she took on the divinity by bearing Christ and by living a holy life. And so she was perfected, and now she lives in heaven with Christ, and she's constantly watching out and taking care of us. Okay. 
No, God did not give her divinity to carry Christ. He, God, Christ himself is the divinity. So she, through her obedience and through her willingness, accepts God into her life the way that we are all able to accept God in our lives. In other words, to say, if we say Panagia has, was given divine nature to bear Christ, it, in other words, that would say we have no shot unless God makes us gods ourselves. Because we, all of us, have to accept Christ in our hearts and in our bodies and in our minds and souls the way that Panagia accepted Christ in her body. So she herself was not God. She was not made God through Christ. She was made godly through Christ and through her divine life. She's not God herself. She's she carried God in her womb. So that's how I would explain that. Of course, we can always read more and, and learn more through the fathers, and hopefully God will continue to enlighten us as well. Okay, on that note, we'll conclude for the day. Thank you all for being here, and uh, we'll meet again next month. God bless. <laughs> Και προστασίες θα μετάθετων ελπίδαν Τάφος και νεκρώσεις φουλ και κράτησεν Ως γαρ ζωής μητέρα προς την ζωή μετέστησεν O mitrani kisas, ai parthenos.